getting ready to run out to see the doctor here in a few minutes. I have my little face mask all ready to go. But before I do, I want to talk about something I've been sitting here pondering on. In this life, we all have frustrations. Frustrations are a normal, everyday occurrence for some people. Some people, is like we always said, ducks, the water just runs off their back. And Jesus was no exception. Jesus got frustrated with his disciples. He got frustrated with their lack of belief. He got frustrated with their lack of understanding. He got frustrated, and when he'd get frustrated, he'd sometimes speak back in a very strong, where one might would say an angry voice. He said, well, we don't know that for sure. Yeah, we kind of do. You know, the nice thing about the English language and the translation from the, the old scripture written in the languages of Hebrew and Latin and Aramic and all of that is that it still carries over tone. When we write things, it has tone. And you can tell when someone's being sarcastic. You can tell when they're frustrated. You can tell when they're angry. You can tell when they're happy and they're just on cloud nine. Jesus, in scolding the apostles, the tone was that of frustration. The tone of that was probably spoken in a very hard-sounding, if not harsh, manner. Especially when he turned to Peter and he said, Peter, Satan desires to have you. When the disciples was arguing about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom of God, his response to them was certainly that of frustration. Why would you even be thinking about such things? The greatest shall be the least, and the least shall be the greatest. And that principle he taught over and over again. In this world, we tend to strive for greatness. Oh, you know, children are taught early on, well, if you want to be great, someday be the president, or be great and someday be like this legislator, or be great like this ball player, or be great like this, this army hero, this uh, Air Force pilot, or Navy ship's captain. If you want to be great... You have to do blah, 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 blah. And you have to do blah, 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 blah. And we, you know, if you want to be great, you have to have a lot of money. And if you want to be great, you have to, we call that success. If you want to be successful, then you have to have a certain degree of education. You have to have read certain books and understand certain logics and philosophies and terminologies. And if you're going to be a minister, well, then you have to have education to go with that. The Bible and the Holy Ghost isn't good enough anymore. Used to be good enough. It's not good enough today. Today you've got to have seminary. You've got to you got to have a degree of some sort behind you. Some study courses behind you. Some professors talking to you. You've got to know about theology, and you've got to know about ancient history, and you've got to know about uh, something, some basic understanding of the Hebrew language. Uh, versus the Greek language, and you've got to know history, you've got to know about Egypt, and you've got to know about uh, Israel, and you have to know about the Hebrew people, and the Chaldeans, and all these various things. So we strive for greatness. And yet, it's strange, isn't it? That Jesus said, for all that labor that you put in to wanting to be so perfect, so respected, so great, earn that fancy title, 
the least shall be the greatest. Not the greatest, the greatest. It's talking about balancing the scale. Balancing the scale. I was talking to a Christian person not too long ago. And they said to me, well, Rich, you know, one of the problems that we have is the Democrats wants to take all the money from the hardworking people and distribute it amongst the lazy and the poor. Sounds like a good argument. Let's distribute. Well, this distribution of funds has been going on since Congress first got their first budget, and it's continued to go on. We distribute funds in different ways. You can distribute funds by doing grants and, and by doing um, money that we give to the farmers and money we give to the oil producers and money we give to a big transportation companies and the ships and trains and we give these these checks to all kinds of people with millions and millions of dollars pharmaceuticals you know how many of the drugs that you're paying a huge amount of money for at the pharmacy to stay alive you already paid for that drug to be researched discovered analyzed packaged and put into production you probably even paid the shipment and the amount of money that we give to enhance shipping in this country. We give to the airlines, air freight companies. We give money in all kinds of ways. The highway departments, that's okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't give monies to farmers and producers and cattlemen and all the other things that we give money to because we give money to them with the ideal being that they will produce the goods in which we wish to purchase and better our lives. But there is some truth that we have this ideal of equity that people who work hard, you know, the Bible says in one place that the laborer is worthy of his hire is worthy of his hire you earn that salary that you get and the producers the manufacturers the cars dealerships wherever you work at the grocery store they pay you based on the number of employees that they need and supposedly based on the profits that they have. And you should be rewarded a piece of that pie because without you, they would have no money. So to level that inequity out, one of the things that we've done is we've developed taxes, a taxation system. Because there's no possible way, for example, I've heard it my whole life. Well, if the church would do their job and take care of the poor in their community, then those poor wouldn't have to be drawing federal funding, state funding. They wouldn't have to go get commodities or food stamps or anything. They wouldn't have to worry about their housing because the church would take care of it. Wonderful ideal in principle. Horrible ideal in practice. It didn't work. It's never worked. In the early church, where it was very limited in size, and the church was not 25 churches in a community, it was one church where all the people came in, and they all learned of Christ together, and they worshiped together, and they prayed together, and they uplifted one another, and they ate together then you could look and say, here is the need in our community, let's meet it. And you could reach out and you could support those from that manner. 
What we found as the nations grew, not only here in America, but in foreign countries, in our home countries like England and France and Germany and all of those, that there had to be some other method. So taxation is a bitter pill, especially if the only thing that you're being taxed for is so some powerful person can wage a war in another country. But if you're being taxed and you're receiving from the benefit of that tax, then the tax isn't quite such a bitter pill because it's giving you the things that you want. So, as you've already heard me say before, the concept of fair investment in people, the tools that make this country great, are the people in this country. Without the people, it's nothing. It's the people that work on the assembly lines that makes the product that sells to make the profit for the corporation. Why should the CEO, who sits up there and does little or nothing most of the time, and if you want to question me on that and say, no, that's not true, they work really hard, then you have no idea what it's like to be at the top of the chain. I'm not saying they do no work, but they do very little. As a former assistant vice president to a bank, one of the largest private-owned banks in the state and the largest private-owned bank in the state St. Louis area, I can tell you there was no job like making it to the president. And even a senior vice president got to work their own schedule and they worked when they kind of wanted to and what they wanted to work at. And most of what work they did do was figuring out how to get more money from the resource of the people that they had of their depositors. And I know because I was climbing that echelon. And as an assistant vice president, I made very good money and they were willing to take care of me well. In the meantime, my job was to make money for the bank. And I did very successfully. And that's what CEOs are hired for. Their idea was to make money for the bank. And most of that is done or by for their corporation. Most of that is done by delegation. They come up with a general idea, a general plan, a thought, a direction they want to go. They might set a financial goal that they want to hit. And then they direct others to carry out those plans. There's a book that was written, I don't remember the gentleman's name, so I apologize for that. But it's about, don't accept the monkeys from other people's backs and put them on your own. And, and the message in that is extremely good. And it's two managers and people who have climbed those, those ladders. At some point you figure out, you can't be fixing everybody else's problems and taking all those problems in on your desk because then you don't have time to do your job and you don't accomplish the goals that those senior people set for you. So you have to learn how when somebody comes in and they say, I just can't do it, I just can't figure it out. You say, no, go back and figure out how, think about it. Try this or try that and give them some guidance. But you don't say, here, give it to me and I'll do it for you. Let me do it for you. When you say, let me do it for you, let me do the thinking for you, let me take the task in hand, they don't learn anything. And you build your load until you only have so much that you can carry. Well, the working people in this country and the poor people in this country. People like to say they're lazy and they like to say they like wallowing around where they're at. And if, Let me tell you something. If you're raised in a certain environment of poverty and you're very poor and it's all you've ever known as a child and no one helps to teach you to make you believe that there is a way out 
then you stay right there. And working with the homeless, I worked with, with uh, Brother Larry Rice and his um, wife at the time, Penny. I worked with their children and him and, and, and their mission both in New Bloomfield and here in the St. Louis area and dealing with the homeless and the poor. And the one thing that you quickly learn is that a lot of people who were successful at one point in their life suddenly become homeless. And you say, well, it's their fault if they become... Sometimes it's because they make some bad choices and sometimes they are things that are way beyond their control. Way beyond their control. And let me look at an example that we have in this country right now. We have in every nation, except I believe it's the Arctica, doesn't have it. And that's the virus. And people who have lost their jobs or unemployed right now, who are drawn unemployment checks. This was no fault of their own, that they're unemployed, that their company has laid them off, that there is no work for them to do. Even in some of the manufacturing that we need, that we need products that would sell right now in vast majority of things like try buying a can of Lysol. You could call that a miracle if you find one on a shelf. Part of the problem is, is that we've, because we were all tied up in this trade war, that we cut down our supplies and our ability to get the raw materials. So if you haven't got the raw materials, you can't put the people to work in the factory creating what they need to create because there's no material to work with. When I was in college, I worked for Cheeseboro Ponds. We, uh, I worked in the plastics division. We made all kinds of plastic containers for Vaseline and lipstick and, and those little things, what do you call them, where you, you have the eye makeup and you eyebrow makeup and you put it on the little holders for those and all kinds of plastic goods. Bottles, jars. The supplier wasn't able to supply us with a certain type of plastic bead that we needed to make a particular line a product. And we were on a delay. And once they were able to supply it, we still had to wait on the trucks to haul it in. We had to shut down that assembly line, retool all the injection press to be able to do a different type of container, go back and put the people back on work and wait for that supplies to come in. And then when the supplies did come in, then we had to shut down the assembly line again redo all the injection press once again, which meant that workers missed a day, two days worth of work. And luckily we had another product line that we had the, the molds ready to go on and we could put them to work doing something else. You're not always that lucky. If you can't get the raw materials because they're held up in another nation and because they're being taxed you can't afford them if you if they were available you know you go to the grocery store right now and people say well if you looked at the price of some of the food it's it's really high and it is and then some of the foods that you could buy six months ago you can't even find on the shelf even as farmers are killing their their pigs and even as cows are being slaughtered and milk thrown away 
because the other parts of the chain are not set to work. And many people, because of this virus, is unemployed. Many will lose their apartments. Many will lose their homes. And we know this. This is a cold, hard reality. So, some of us, and if you really know me, you've heard me say this all the way back in my high school days in high school, when I voted for Richard Nixon, by the way. But you've heard me argue this in class. We need to invest in the people. And corporations won't do it. They'll go the merit bare minimal because they're interested in their profit margin. They're interested in their stockholders. Because you buy stock because stocks earned you money. If stocks didn't earn you money, you would invest in stocks. So in order for the stocks to have value and to increase, then the corporation has to make a profit. And then the stock increases. And then you make money because they made money. But in the meantime, if you don't force the corporation to invest and it's people, then the people, there's an imbalance that takes place in the scale. So if corporations and businesses of all kinds would do the right thing and invest in the worker, then you could change the equity margin slowly but surely so that there would be a more equal spending. But we don't do that. And being we are a free economy, and that is what we do believe in, the ability for businesses to operate at their own will, at their own desire, to profit as they might, we don't want to put those kind of guidelines and laws and regulations into place because that would make us a socialist nation. Because, see, that is what a socialist nation is. That's where the government controls everything. Not just the worker controls the factory, its profit margin, the banks, and all the other institutions. We don't want to do that. I don't know of a single Democrat that I've ever talked to in my entire 65 years that's ever wanted to do that. What we do want to do, though, is, is see, instead of us giving an oil company who made a trillion dollars profit another $50 billion of tax money so that they can make more profit, we want to see some of that money spent more equitably in the poorer people and train people in a way that they can get out of poverty, that they can move up the chain. When I went to college, man, the recruiter had all kinds of amazing stories to tell me of all kinds of amazing money that was just waiting for my graduation day. But when graduation day came, all those big money jobs just wasn't there. And I ended up taking a job that wasn't very great pay, just as many college kids are today. And the pay wasn't all that great. But I knew that I was not satisfied wearing a tool belt every day for the rest of my life, turning nuts and bolts, that I wanted to do something more. So I put in the work. I put in the motivation to go to the managers 
and the people above me and say, what do I need to do to climb to the next step? What do I need to learn to go from this to this to this and progressively climb those steps? Now, I was fortunate because I worked with people who wanted to help me climb those steps. And I've worn a number of very interesting hats, and I'm not going to go through that list again. You've, some of you have heard my resume before. I've been privileged to do a good number of things, to learn a number of different skills, and to walk in some different paths in this life. And most important always was God and serving God and preaching the gospel first. Why would I make that the most important thing? Because people are the most important thing to me. Their salvation. They're finding Christ. And see, I know that a person who is fed and who is looking for hope and looking to climb out of the ditch and looking to find that path that will take them to success, to a greater lifestyle, needs to be shown, just like they need to be shown the way to salvation, just like they need to be taught how to live, how to be a Christian in your attitudes and your attributes of life what that means to be Christ-like. If you don't know who Christ is, and you don't know how he lived, you're not likely to be Christ-like in how you live. If you don't know what it means to be born again, then you will accept shaking hands with some 10-cent preacher as salvation. And that's not what it is. So, from a political view, I believe that Jesus taught the church's chief role was to be a pathfinder and to cut down the weeds and open up the way for people to find salvation. And maybe the first and greatest example of that was John the Baptist, who said, I am but a voice, as one crying in the wilderness. Make your path straight. The forerunner, the one who began to cut down the weeds of the world around him and talk about salvation and one greater than he, whose shoes he was not worthy to even tie. So I think that in this time of distress, this time of frustration, this time in which we live, we need to stop thinking so much only about ourselves and what we have or what we hope to have, but to begin to think more about others. And let's invest in people. Let's take some of that tax revenue and, and train people on how to climb the ladder. How to take the steps one step at a time and get out. And in order to do that, we have to meet some needs. A hungry man who's seeking a piece of bread isn't going to listen to anything you got to say until you fed him. Once he's had a full belly, then he can sit back and hear what you say. Because prior to that, his stomach is growling too much. The only thing he hears is a stomach growling and he feels the hunger. We have an opportunity to follow the example of Christ. Jesus went on the mountain and the disciples said, Oh Lord, the people are fainting. They're getting hungry. Let me tell you something. I look around me and there are a lot of hungry folk. They're hungry to do better. They're worried about where they're at. They're scared. And many will give up hope. Some will commit suicide. Some will fall into the ways of homelessness. 
and find no way out. Some will turn to alcohol, drug abuse. Let's give them a way out. Jesus said, well, let's feed the people. And they said, what are we going to feed them with? They looked around and there was a someone that had a little basket with five little fishies and three loaves of bread. And he said, here, take this and pass it out. And they looked and they said, but there's not enough. How can we feed 5,000 people with three loaves and five fishes? The people's hungry. And he said, feed the people. Where's your faith? Feed the people. You know what they did? They began to pass out. The basket stayed full. Five fishes, no matter how many you took out, five fishes, how many loaves you took out, three loaves. They fed the whole multitude till they was full, and then they took up extra. There was leftover. I believe that if we as an American nation would return to the principle of taking care of people and making people our priority, if we would quit worrying about, you're using my tax money to give it to that guy who's lazy, and quit worrying about that, what if, what if that little boy holding his basket of three loaves and that little girl holding her basket of five fishes would have said, no, these are mine. I'm not giving these up. No, Jesus. Well, because Jesus is Jesus, he'd have found another way. But Jesus being Jesus, they loved and trusted him enough to give. Oh, how weak our faith is in this nation. The most powerful nation in the world, and yet we think that we cannot subsidize the poor people and train the poor people and help those people who are homeless and help those people who are unemployed, who are sitting there about to lose everything. People who were making sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year now sitting there with an unemployment check of $320 a week and you're worried about helping them keep their house, keep their home because it's your little five loaves. It's your little three, three loaves and five fishes. God help you. Repent. Put your faith in the God of gods, the great I am. Because God is getting frustrated. When Jesus got frustrated, you know what the disciples did? And some of you will get angry at me. But I'm going to tell you this. You know what Jesus did? He turned and he scolded Peter. He scolded John. When John started talking about, well, he's the loved disciple. Well, Jesus called him the beloved disciple in a number of times. And John let that go to his head. And Jesus had to scold him. When they turned the church into a den of thieves, Jesus was angry and scolded them. But let me tell you, I want you to hear this, understand this. They loved Jesus enough to accept the scolding. They loved Jesus enough not only to accept the scolding, but to realize he was right. And to change their mind. And to change their attitude. We need to change our minds and our attitudes in America. We need to start helping one another and uplifting one another. Quit worrying that your tax money is going to somebody who doesn't deserve it. Because let me tell you something. The least shall be the greatest. They deserve it. They deserve it now. Not in the kingdom to come. They deserve to be fed now. They need to be clothed now. They need to be housed now. Because Jesus said, In as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. 
you might be part of the 1% and live in your ivory towers and have all the finest and wealth. But I can tell you, most of the people I know don't. And there's a few I know who probably make 250, 300,000 between them and their wife. Even some of them are suffering right now because they only have one income. And some of them have been laid off and they only have the unemployment coming in. Hundreds of thousands of people in this country live off of disability and social security benefits. And you're worried about putting them in nice homes and nice housing. You're worried that it's going to take a little of your tax money. Let me tell you something. Maybe I'm foolish. Maybe I'm stupid. Maybe I'm the dumbest of the dumb. The old country boy that ain't got nothing to think with but a rock in his head. But I'm going to tell you, I'd rather give my money, my tax money, to help these poor people and help them be able to climb the ladder and become taxpayers so that they're helping other people and make our nation grow by becoming a beautiful place to visit where you drive down the streets and you don't see homeless tents, where you don't see people having to rob in order to feed their family. I'd much rather see that than watch a corporation who's already making the trillions and billions of dollars in profit get more of my tax money. So if you call that diversifying wealth and you think that's wrong, you better believe I believe in diversifying wealth. I believe in a tax system where they must pay because they are wealthy to give their five loaves, their five fishes and three loaves. Maybe I have that backwards. Maybe it's five loaves and three fishes, whichever it was. Story doesn't change. Because they have it. And nothing that we're going to do and no tax burden established is going to hurt them or make them not rich. They've just gotten greedy. Think about the rich man in Lazarus. Yeah, he found out that the least was made greatest. And then it was too late. Then, because he was now the least, he begged for water. And there was no water coming. Lazarus wasn't going to lift him up. You're seeing corporations that are closing their doors and jobs being lost, not because we haven't subsidized them, but because we haven't subsidized the people enough that the people have the means to buy. Restaurants are empty. Many of them are serving food to take out, but who can afford it? So you order a McDonald's meal on DoorDash, you order a $6.49 hamburger and order of fries and your tab is $9. And then you tack on a delivery fee and you tack on taxes. And you're looking at a bill of suddenly $14.95. And then you tack on the tip to the driver. And if you're like me, because I care about people, I try to make that tip reasonable. $5, maybe even more if I could. Now, that's $20 for that little fast food meal to be delivered. How many of those can you afford when you're on unemployment at $320 a week? Let me tell you how many you can afford. Zero. God has blessed you. And you have a job. And you have an income. And you pay some taxes. And those taxes go to Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare and housing assistance and daycare assistance and work programs and training programs and Pell Grants for education. All of those things are wonderful things that make for a great country. We're just not doing it enough because people have gotten greedy.
if you're not putting people first, then you're not putting God first. And if you're not putting God first, then you're not putting people first. And until you put God first, you will not be accepted into the kingdom that is yet to come. You better change your way of thinking. Call it Democrat, call it Republican, call it Buju. A new party, Buju. You better change your way of thinking. You better start worrying about how to feed the 5,000, how to give the 5,000 clothing, how to take care of the sick, how to do the things that Invest in the people. Because when you invest in the people, you're investing in yourself. You reap what you sow. It's that plain. It's that simple. Do good unto others, and they'll do good unto you. God bless you.